Hi students, this is Mrs. Foy, and this is a screencast about water in Chapter 3 of Pearson Biology for, um, for AP Biology. So we're going to talk a little bit about water and a little bit about the basics of chemistry. So one of the most important parts um, about chemistry for living things is the water molecule. And I know you guys all know this, right? So water has one um, oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. And because of the way the characteristics of these particular atoms, oxygen is very electronegative. That means it is like a vacuum cleaner for other atoms' electrons. It pulls the electrons toward it. And so it's actually taking hydrogen's electrons and pulling it closer in this electron cloud to the oxygen end. And so it makes a partial negative charge. And that's the symbol for that. The hydrogen end of the water molecule, um, hydrogen has its um, its electrons, it's sharing a pair, it's sharing an electron with oxygen, but it's no match for oxygen's electronegativity. And so the electron that hydrogen has is being pulled closer to the oxygen end. And so it makes this end of the water molecule um, partially positive. And so there is a type of bond called an intermolecular bond. It's not a bond that holds atoms together, but it, it is a bond that attracts separate water molecules towards each other. And so a very special type of intermolecular bond is called a hydrogen bond, and that's what makes water have its unique characteristics. So because of this hydrogen bonding, water has these crazy characteristics. So it's cohesive, um, which means that the water molecules pull together, right? The positive end of one mo molecule is ending up uh, being attracted to the negative end of another. And that's called cohesion, right? So there is this, um, wait, this make this positive, make this negative. And so there is an attraction. That's called cohesion. Adhesion is when the water molecule is attracted to the sides of the vessel that it's in. W uh, surface ten tension, you can think of, um, I always think of surface tension. If this is a, a body of water, you're looking at it from the side. Surface tension is kind of like a piece of saran wrap over the top. It's actually the water molecules being more attracted to each other on the surface of the water than they are to the air. And so it creates something called surface tension. And capillary action is this, this law of physics that happens that when you have water in a very tiny tube, in a very thin tube that it tends to pull the water up as, a, as a, an effect of the cohesion and the adhesion properties of water. It tends to pull up like a straw the water up. And that becomes very important for living things. Like trees, okay? So trees have special types of tissues that transport water called xylem. And you can see that xylem is the, are these very thin tubes, if you're looking at them long ways. And that's one of the reasons uh, why water can be pulled up to the leaves, because the leaves is where the water the, where the water is needed for photosynthesis. Where does the water come from? Way down in the roots. And so the water has got to travel a long way up the xylem from the roots of plants up to the leaves. And that would not be possible if water didn't have these characteristics. So I grew up in Ohio, and we used to call these bugs Jesus bugs because they could walk on water. Um, but this is displaying, this insect is utilizing the characteristic of surface tension, right? So water has a high surface tension. This bug could not do that if this was a lake of alcohol, say. But it's using um, the surface tension and its specially designed feet to be able to take advantage of that. So 
This is very important. Water modulates the temperature on Earth. That means if it's very hot, it makes it cooler. If it's very cold, it makes it warmer. And that's because water has a very high specific heat. Specific heat is the amount of heat that it has to have for one gram of the substance to change by one degree centigrade. So water has a really high specific heat. And so because of that, it is going to change temperature less than other substances. And this is all due to that intermolecular bonding, the hydrogen bonding that it has. So large bodies of water, like big lakes and oceans, for example, and the water on the inside of our bodies are going to modulate temperature differences. So another thing that water does for us is it, it, it does this thing called evaporative cooling. Okay, so why do we sweat? So evaporative cooling is taking advantage of something called the heat of vaporization. So the heat of vaporization is the amount of heat needed for one gram of a liquid to be converted to a gas, right? So a phase change from a liquid to a gas. So think of it this way. Only the hottest molecules on my skin on a very hot day are going to have enough energy to, ap uh, to actually evaporate into a gas. So the liquid on my skin, only the hottest molecules are going to evaporate and turn into a gas. And so what happens is, is the average temperature of the water molecules that are left as a liquid on the sweat of my skin is actually... Um, decreases because the hottest ones just left and so it makes me feel cooler. So let's look a little bit about the structure of ice versus the structure of water. So water does this really weird thing. So you guys know that we have three phases, right? So we have solid, we have liquid, and we have gas. And the kinetic energy is going to be the highest in a gas molecule. The highest energy, they're moving the most. The lowest kinetic energy, the lowest kinetic energy is going to be in a solid. So in these water molecules, we have a medium amount of energy, kinetic energy. And these guys are moving around, and they're moving around enough that they can't actually break or very few of them actually escape these hydrogen bonds and become gases, but they're constantly breaking and reforming those bonds. That is very different than ice, all right? In ice, the molecules have the least energy. So they have the least um, uh, kinetic energy. They can't move as much. And so they get kind of handcuffed by these hydrogen bonds and it forms a very stable crystal where they're vibrating, they're not, they're not stock still. If it was zero degrees K, they would be stock still. But they're, they're stable in this pattern, and they're actually farther apart than they are in the liquid. So that's really kind of crazy, right? And so what that means is that means that, that ice can actually float, right? So here in the gas state, there is no or very little hydrogen bonding because the gas molecules are moving fast enough they can break those. In water, they are breaking them, but they're reforming them. They can't move fast enough to escape to be a gas. But in solid ice, they can't, their kinetic energy is, is less. And so the hydrogen bondings, uh, the hydrogen bonds really um, form um, very strongly in these in these structures and it forms this crystal which is actually less dense you can even see that here than than the liquid okay and that creates some cool so most solid substances sink they have greater density than their liquids but water is crazy it floats right it has less density as a solid than it does as a liquid and that sets up some tremendous physical parameters for life on Earth, right? So even in very cold environments where we have ice forming, like in a lake or a pond or, or even in the ocean, underneath we have liquid water. And so that is, that is crucial for organ organisms living in colder environments because they're not frozen solid. 
So this is just a little review for you about how to make something called an aqueous solution. So here I have an ionic substance. This is sodium chloride, right? So sodium ion and chloride ion make this uh, make this ionic compound that we know as salt. And what happens when we put salt in water? Well, you guys know that it dissolves. Um, and it actually also dissociates. It breaks into ions. So there is a difference between dissolving and dissociating. Dissolving means it's surrounded by water. Dissociating means it actually breaks into its ions. And I can see the water molecules are attacking the negative ion. And notice that the positive end of the water molecule, remember the hydrogen end is more positive, is surrounding that. Look at the sodium end. Well, here I've got the, the electronegative oxygen on this side. And so those are all surrounding that. And so um, this is going to dissolve into an aqueous solution. The solute is my sodium chloride, and the solvent is water. So in biology, the solvent is almost always water. So a colloid is something where um, it looks like a solution, but it's really not, because the particles that are in there are large and do not uh, dissolve. So whole milk is an example of a colloid because it has some pretty big proteins in there. If you actually let, and some fats, if you let it sit there for a long time, it will actually separate if it hasn't been homogenized, which means blended up. And so, uh, so this is a colloid, not a solution. And blood is probably the most famous colloid in our bodies because um, we have cells inside of our liquid blood, and that forms a colloid. So let's talk about water-soluble proteins. Guys, there's going to be a huge difference between something that's soluble in water and something that's not. It's going to um, make the characteristics of that chemical super important for us. So here I've got my big purple protein. And um, this one is going to have the chemistry of this protein, is, and we'll learn more about that in the next chapter, is going to be such that water is attracted to it. And because of that, it forms this kind of layer of water molecules around it that makes that protein dissolve in water. And that's called a hydration shell. So every chemical that we have, um, we can, in living things, we can basically divide it into two groups. It's, it's either polar or it's nonpolar. And one thing that's going to be very important is that you're going to hear something that, I, that I'm going to say a lot that is, is, goes like this. It says, like dissolves like. So polar molecules like other polar molecules, which means that they're attracted to them and they can be dissolved in them. Nonpolar molecules like other nonpolar molecules, which means they can be dissolved by other nonpolar molecules. The fancy word for these forms, uh, these words, are going to be hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Okay? Hydro means water, and then philic means loving. All right? So hydrophilic means water loving. Hydrophobic, if you have a phobia, you don't like something, means water hate. So now we're going to get into a little bit of chemistry here. And I need to talk about something called a mole. So a mole in chemistry, uh, for those of you that have not had chemistry yet, a mole in chemistry is not the little furry thing. A mole is kind of like a dozen in chemistry. So um, you know the word pair always means two things, right? A dozen always means 12 things. 12 things. A ream of something like a ream of paper always means 500 things. A mole of something is this ridiculously big number. 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles in a mole. And so this number is so big that if we had a mole of marbles, so you can imagine a marble in your, in your mind, if we had a mole of marbles, how many marbles would that be? Well, that would be enough marbles to cover the surface of the earth five miles deep in marbles. So it's a ridiculously big number, but we use it all the time in chemistry. And why? Because we are 
talking about very small things, guys. We're counting very small things like atoms, molecules, and so what does a mole look like? Well, chemists don't usually count particles. We use the mass to figure that out. And so there is a relationship between the mass of that substance and one mole. So for example, sulfur, all right? Sulfur has a molar mass of 32.07 grams in a mole. That means one mole of sulfur weighs 32.07 grams. And you can calculate this from using the atomic mass on the periodic table. And so that's usually how we use molarity in, in chemistry and biology. Sucrose, this is a molecule, a table sugar, uh, sucrose is table sugar, um, is 180.18 grams per mole. So that means one mole of sucrose weighs 180.18 grams. That also means that in that jar there, there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23, in this case, molecules of sucrose. Over here, because I'm talking about an element, there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms, atoms of sulfur in that container. So let's do a mole problem, right? We can be sure that a mole of table sugar and a mole of vitamin C are equal in, well, it's not, um, it's not going to be Dalton's that's weight. It's not going to be grams, right? Because we just saw that a mole of two things can weigh different amounts. Atoms, this is a tricky question because these guys are both compounds. And so they're not elements. So the particle we're measuring is the molecule. So the answer is D. They would have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. We also have something that we need to know in AP Biology called molarity. Molarity sounds an awful lot like mole, and it is partially have to do with it because one of the, um, uh, one of the measurement tools that we use to measure molarity is the moles of the solute. But molarity is a double unit, so it's like density. And molarity, we always use a capital M, and molarity is equal to the moles of the substance of the solute divided by the liters of the solution, okay? So it's a way of measuring concentration. There are other ways of measuring concentration. Um, uh, if you guys use those little um, flavor packets for your water, you're making a solution, right? So let's say you're adding some into your water bottle. Well, if you like it to be sweeter, you might make it more concentrated. If you don't like it as sweet, you might not put as much of the solute in and make it more watery. So it would have a less molarity. So molarity has to do with the um, the concentration of the solute in the volume of solution. So here's our first molarity problem, and this is what I tell my students, and I wish you would do this because it would be awesome if you did. If you see a capital M right there, stop and make it into the double unit. That capital M is a double unit in disguise, okay? So it says, what is the molarity? So I'm gonna put the unit that I want over on the right, right? I'm shooting for moles per liter. If I have 4.5 moles of it dissolved in two liters. Well, I hope your teacher has taught you, if you want a double unit, if you want a double unit, you're going to start with a double unit. And you might say, well, Mrs. Foy, I don't see a double unit. Right, you gotta make one. So this is going to be 4.5 moles divided by 2 liters. And if you do that arithmetic, you will get the answer of 2.25 molar, or moles per liter, because I only have, actually I only have one sig fig here. So technically it would just be 2 molar. Vol uh, molarity problem number two. What is the volume of solvent needed to make a 1.5 molar solution if you have 0.9 moles of it? Okay, do what I said, right? Make this into the double unit that it really is. That means 1.5 moles per liter. So I want volume. It doesn't say what, so I'm going to guess liters. All right, because it doesn't say what unit. But look, guys, I want a single unit. I want a single unit. So I hope your teacher has taught you, if you want a single unit answer, you have to start 
with a single unit. Okay, and which one of these is a single unit? Not that one, it's going to be this 0.9 moles. So I'm going to start with 0.9 moles. Okay, now I'm going to use my double unit here. I'm going to use my factor labeling or dimensional analysis tools. And I see that if I flip that molarity, which I'm allowed to do, and flip it so that the moles is on the bottom, I just inverted it. Now my moles cancel and I have liters. And if you do the arithmetic on that, you get 0.6 liters. Now if the problem said uh, how many milliliters, well then I could just quickly convert that. I know that there are 1,000 milliliters in a liter and then I would get my answer of 600 milliliters. So another calculation we have to do in AP Biology is we have to do concentration problems. So in chemistry, we use the formula M1V1 V1 is equal to M2V2. This M1 stands for molarity, and the V stands for volume. So this means the molarity times the volume in one condition equals the molarity times the volume in another condition. And for some reason, um, in AP Bio, they use C instead of M, and this just means concentration, okay? So, guys, there's a conspiracy to just make your life more difficult by using all these different, uh, different things that you have to keep track of. So, M1V1 is equal to, is equal to the same thing as C1V1, and um, we can do a lot of very cool problems with this. So, molarity problem number, uh, no, number one here. M1V1 is equal to M2V2. If you have a 1.25 molar glucose solution, right? So this is moles per liter, but I actually don't have to change it in this one because I'm not solving for specific um, moles here. So I can leave it just like that for these problems. And I want to make two liters of a 0.5 molar solution. What is the volume of the original solution you would need to dilute? Okay, so what I'm saying is I'm, I'm going to use this equation. M1V1 is equal to M2V2. The original molarity is 1.25 molar, and the second molarity is 0 0.05 molar, and the second uh, volume is 2 liters. So clearly, I am solving for volume 1. So I can use my algebra skills. And I can say M2V2 divided by M1 is equal to V2. So now I can just plug and chug. I can say, well, my second volume was point, whoops, sorry, uh, point zero 0.05 molar. And I multiply that times my second volume divided by my original molarity. Okay, and notice how my moles cancel. And if you had changed it to moles per liter, it would have canceled as well. And the unit I have left is liters, right, is liters. And if you do the arithmetic with that, your answer is 0 0.08 liters. So what does that mean? That means that if I took 0 0.08 liters of this original concentration and I diluted it to 2 liters, I would have this concentration as my final concentration. And again, if the problem asks you to convert to milliliters, no problem. You know how to do that. And then you would just say, OK, well, I would need 80 milliliters of the original solution to make that dilution. Let's try another one, OK? This problem says if you took 0.5 liters of a 0.8 zero molar solution of albumin, albumin is a blood protein, and diluted it to two liters, what is your final concentration of your albumin solution? So I'm going to use my M1V1 is equal to M2V2, and I'm going to plug in my, ver my, uh, my, uh, my variables here. So I have a 0.5 liter of my original solution, and my original concentration is 0.8 molar. I also know that my final volume is 2 liters. So clearly, I'm solving for molarity 2. So I'm going to use my algebra skills. M1V1 divided by V2 is equal to M2. Now I can plug and chug. So what was my original molarity? 0.8 molar. 
what was my original volume? 0.5 liters. And then my final volume was 2 liters. And then um, you're going to use your arithmetic skills and you would get the answer of 0.2 molar. That means the final concentration of my albumin solution was 0.2 molar. So now let's talk a little bit about the chemistry of water, all right, and what happens to water molecules. So what happens is, you know, we have, we've already talked about, we have this partial charge on a water molecule. Um, the oxygen end is more electronegative. And guys, when it ends up close to another water molecule, sometimes this oxygen, this electronegative oxygen, pulls one of those hydrogens off. That hydrogen bond is so strong. And so then it makes two separate ions. It makes an H3O plus, right, because it had an extra hydrogen that was on there. And we call this hydronium ion. And then the leftover water molecule that got its hydrogen taken away, we call it a hydroxide molecule. And so notice that if these guys got back together, then you would have H2O. You'd actually have two H2O, all right? Two water molecules. So this hydronium ion, all right, a lot of times to make things simpler um, in chemistry, in AP Bio, instead of just talking about a hydrogen proton, we have to remember that in biology, we always have water around, right? Water is ubiquitous. And what that means is you're never going to just have an H plus molecule floating around. You, I mean, really, you're not, okay? So to be technically true, in living systems, an H plus is really a hydronium molecule, right? Because there's always water around. And that proton is going to be picked up by that water molecule to make hydronium. So just keep that in the back of your mind. So now let's talk about pH, all right? pH is a measure of acidity or basicity or alkalinity. And pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, which remember we could easily replace that with hydronium, okay? Same difference. Um, ranges from 0 to 14. So we know this, right? 7 is neutral. And, you know, an AP Bio student should have some hip pocket examples of typical strong bases, right? These are also called alkaline um, substances or acidic substances, right? So you should have a basic idea of, well, ammonia is alkaline and lemon juice is, you know, acidic. So what's interesting about pH is it doesn't have any units. It's one of those unusual quantities in science that doesn't have a unit. So notice the negative sign. Um, we put that negative sign there. pH, they actually made this up so that you would get a positive number um, when you're calculating. So it's the negative log base 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration. And that is what, that's what pH is, okay? So again, uh, this is important for living things because as we're going to see, having a stable pH is one of the most important aspects of keeping living things alive. So um, human blood, if you change the pH of human blood, even several um, tenths of a pH, that is a quick way to kill somebody. Seawater is slightly alkaline. And again, the pH cannot vary very much because living things um, have a very small range of pH to be able to adapt to that. So as we go more toward the acidic side of the scale, we have way more hydrogen ion than hydroxide ion. As you go towards the base end of the pH scale, we have way more hydroxide ions than we do hydro hydrogen ions. So technically speaking, um, at, I think it's 25 degrees C and one atmosphere of pressure or something, only one out of this many water molecules dissociates. 
right? And so we get the hydrogen ion concentration at equilibrium is equal to 10 to the minus 7th. The negative log of 10 to the minus 7th is 7. So that's how we get the pH is 7 at neutral. So I like this diagram because it's really showing you kind of what is happening here. So let's look at this. At a pH of 7, so in this cartoon, these red things are hydrogen ions or hydronium, whatever you want to think of it, and these blue things are hydroxides, okay? So look at the pH of 0 when we want 1. I have lots of hydrogen protons. Over here, I've got lots of hydroxide ions. At a pH of 7, I am going to have the same amount. So my hydroxide ion concentration is equal to my hydro, uh, uh, hydrogen ion concentration, right? And so you can look at these things and, and figure this out. So as you, go, as you go lower on the pH scale and lower again, do you see I have less and less hydroxide ions. I've got a greater, greater concentration of hydrogen ions and my pH goes down, right? So the hydrogen ion goes up, the pH goes down. That's very confusing for people. As you go this way, notice that my pH is increasing, but look what is happening to my hydroxide ion concentration. It's going way, way down. All right, so my hydrogen ion concentration is going down. I hope I said that right. My hydroxide ion concentration is going up. So um, I just think that's a good way to, to visualize that. So at neutral, right, we have a pH of uh, 7, and that's going to be a hydrogen ion concentration of 10 to the minus 7th, and also a pOH concentration of 10 to the minus 7th. So a couple of quick little characteristics of acids. Acids are sour. So think of citric acid. Think of like that's what they put in Sour Patch Kids to make it sour. Hydrox uh, hydrogen ion is greater than hydroxide. The substances have a large hydrogen ion concentration. And here's an example of an equation of where we have an acid. In water, that's what AQ means, it dissociates, which means it breaks down into ions, into hydrogen ion and chlorine, chloride um, ion. And so strong acids like hydrochloric acids break down completely. They completely dissociate. And that's what's meant by this arrow that goes in one way. We also have things called weak acids. And the most famous weak acid in biology is probably carbonic acid, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Carbonic acid only partially dissociates and it's reversible. So that is what is meant by this arrow that goes both ways. So that means that only some of the um, carbonic, uh, and we can also say this is hydrogen carbonate, but carbonic acid if, if it's in water, is going to only partially break down because sometimes this hydrogen ion and this bicarbonate ion are going to go back together to make more carbonic acid. Okay, so clearly there would be less hydrogen protons around in a weak acid than in a strong acid where you would have more hydrogen protons, right? Because this guy is, is holding some of these onto its molecule. How about bases? Bases are bitter. A lot of medicines are bases. Um, they're alkaline substances, so they're anything that can reduce a hydrogen ion concentration, or you can think of it as having a high hydroxide ion concentration. So if there's more hydroxide than hydrogen, or if you have substances that remove hydrogen proton, that would be a base. And again, we have strong bases and weak bases. Strong bases completely dissociate in water, and weak bases only partially or irreversibly dissociate in water. So each pH unit represents a tenfold difference in the hydrogen ion concentration, okay? So if you are going from a pH of 2 to a pH of 3, that's going to be 10 times less acidic, right? Because the lower number is more acidic.
So if you go from a pH of 2 to a pH of 6, so 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, each one of these is going to be 10 times, right? So if I'm going from a 6, this is 10 times more acidic, 10 times more acidic, 10 times more acidic, 10 times more acidic. So 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 is 10,000 times more acidic if you're going from a pH of 6 to a pH of 2. So in AP Biology, we only have to do some simple um, acid uh, pH, acid base uh, calculations. And this is one that you need to remember, OK? If you multiply the hydrogen ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration, that should equal uh, 10 to the minus 14. So we can do some pretty simple problems with this. And so let's try some. Measurements show that the pH of a particular lake is 4. What is the hydrogen ion concentration? And so the hydrogen ion concentration of 4 is going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 4 molarity. And so the correct answer here would be C. Now it says, of that same lake, what is the hydroxide ion concentration? Well, if the hydrogen ion concentration was 10 to the minus 4, right? So this was the hydrogen ion concentration. And I know that the hydroxide ion concentration multiplied that has to be 10 to the minus 14, right, by that one uh, slide that I just showed you. The hydroxide ion concentration has got to be 10 to the minus 10. And so that's my answer for this problem. All right, so what's a buffer? Well, a buffer is a substance that minimizes big changes in pH. And as I've already told you, biological systems really have to have, there's only a small range of pH that is, uh, that is consistent with life. And so we use buffers uh, in human bodies and all living things have buffers to try to minimize big swings in pH that would kill them. All right, and buffers are usually combinations of hydrogen, uh, of of hydrogen ion donors and hydrogen ion acceptors, right? And usually we find these in weak acids or bases. So, just a a a, a quick little reminder about what happens when you have pH changes. Microbes in the blood are affected, and sometimes that can actually make them make us sicker. They can become more pathogenic. Enzymes become denatured. They don't work. Oxygen delivery to cells can suffer. And that's because the hemoglobin that carries the oxygen is affected by pH. And the organs of your body can become compromised. Um, and mineral assimilation can get thrown off. So uh, we have lots of minerals in our blood um, that are, are very important, um, chloride, iron concentrations, these can get thrown off by big changes in pH. So it shouldn't surprise you that blood has buffers in it, all right? And one of the most important buffers in blood is hydrogen carbonate. Hydrogen carbonate, also called carbonic acid, okay, aka carbonic acid. Technically, if it's in water, which of course this is <laughs> because it's in a living thing, um, it is called carbonic acid, all right? So let's take a look at this, okay? In, remember this means it's going to go both ways, right? It can, it's reversible, right? Because it's a weak acid. This is weak acid, all right? So let's take a look at what this does, okay? If you have a rise in pH, right? So if I have um, a rise in pH, that means less hydrogen proton, okay? So if you have a rise, oh, I'm so sorry, erase what I just said. <laughs> if I have a rise in pH, I am going to have, oh yeah, I just said that right, good. 
this, you see how confusing this is. So I have a higher pH. If I have a higher pH, like, like 10 or 14, that's going to be more alkaline. That means I'm going to have less hydrogen proton. If I have less of this, what's going to happen is this equilibrium is going to shift to the right. This is going to dissociate more to try to kind of fill in those gaps. And so that would then give off more hydrogen proton. And so that's going to uh, normalize the pH, right? If I have a drop in pH, so if the pH gets lower, that means I'm going to have more and more hydrogen proton. If the hydrogen proton goes up, if I start to have more and more and more of these, then it's going to shift the equilibrium this way, and it's going to create more carbonic acid right? It's going to create more carbonic acid, which is going to take some of this out of the system and is going to equilibrate the pH towards a more neutral pH. So I want to talk a little bit about acid rain. Um, anytime that we burn fossil fuels, of course, we know we get carbon dioxide, which is uh, the problem with climate change. But we also get um, pollutants called NOx and SOx. And these are going to be uh, nitrates and nitrites. You don't have to know that, but I'll just tell you that. And these are going to be sulfates and sulfites, right? And so we use X to just mean they could be different uh, types of polyatomic ions. So these NOx and SOx react with the water in the atmosphere to form two pretty bad acids. Nitric acid and SOx react with water in the atmosphere to form sulfuric acid. And while I'm at it, let's just go ahead and talk about CO2 reacts with water in the atmosphere to form carbonic acid, right? But these two acids, sulfuric acid and nitric acid, are a lot stronger. So one of the things that has happened um, as a result of COVID is the particulate matter, the, the SOx and the NOx, which are pollutants from burning fossil fuels, driving cars and burning coal burning power plants, it has dramatically increased the air quality um, in places all over the world. So here's a picture of what happened in China during the COVID shutdown in the uh, spring of 2020. This is a picture of um, a big city in India and you can tell the water, the air quality is so much better. This is LA, right? And this is amazing. Normally you certainly can't see the beautiful mountains in LA as clearly as you can like that. Now uh, the, the air quality is starting to go back to bad again, of course, because the, the shutdown has been lifted. So acid rain, we know that this produces nitric acid, nitric acid, and SOx plus water is going to form sulfuric acid or sulfurous acid. And this can affect uh, living things as well as building structures and statues, okay? And so we know that uh, acid precipitation, so this could be acid snow, it could be acid rain, it could even be acid fog, is going to affect living things. And one of the things that's really interesting is that, you know, we have a lot of people in this corridor of the United States, and we have big, tall smokestacks, right, when we're burning coal to produce electricity. And what happens is, is that the prevailing winds are going to shift our air pollutants up to our neighbor, um, in Canada. And uh, they're not very happy about that. Um, and so there are particular areas in the Northeast in Canada that have higher um, problems with, uh, with acid rain uh, precipitation. One of the things that is happening right now because of climate change is ocean acidification. So we have a lot of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, as you know, because we're burning fossil fuels. Oceans absorb almost one-third of our atmospheric CO2. Thank you, oceans. 
Um, and so they absorb, we'd have a lot worse problem with climate change if we didn't have oceans around. But there's a problem because the carbon dioxide reacts with the water in the oceans to form, remember this, carbonic acid, right? And carbonic acid is decreasing the pH of our oceans. And that is having tremendous, um, tremendous effects on living things in the ocean one of which is coral. Coral lives in a symbiotic relationship with a particular type of algae. And when the pH becomes more acidic, it kills this algae. And the algae dies off. And so the coral, which is a, a living animal actually, um, begins to look white. And that's called coral bleaching. And then it dies. And the, uh, the coral um, biomes in the ocean are some of the most productive biomes on the earth. And they're habitats for, you know, millions of creatures. And, you know, we also have to think about that oceans are a source of food for one out of six humans on the face of the earth. So why should you care about ocean acidification? Our very survival depends on so this graph tells the story, right? As atmospheric carbon dioxide starts to increase, right? As it starts to increase. And this up and down thing that you see is just the annual cycle of photosynthesis and uh, predominantly photosynthesis and respiration during the growth um, periods in the northern hemisphere. But this carbon dioxide is going to go up. The amount of CO2 in the oceans is going up because the oceans are absorbing that CO2. And our pH is becoming more acidic, right? So it's going down. Our pH is becoming more acidic. So what has happened if we look at the pH of the oceans from mostly pre-industrial ages and uh, from 1850 forward, normal pH is slightly alkaline in ocean. It's about 8.2. The current pH average in our oceans is 8.1. And you're like, well, big deal, Mrs. Foy. It's only a point, it's only a tenth of a pH. But that makes a huge difference, guys. Remember, I told you that changes, small changes in pH are going to be making a big changes in the survivability of living things in our oceans. So again, this is what is happening, right? So we have atmospheric carbon dioxide forms carbonic acid. But here's something that happens. Lots of organisms that use their shells. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna go whole hog on the chemistry here, okay? So this is an irreversible reaction. Here is my bicarbonate ion and here's my hydrogen ion, okay? So shells need bicarbonate. They need this bicarbonate mineral to make calcium carbonate, which is what their shell is made of, okay? So let's look what's happening with our problem here. As the oceans are becoming more and more acidic, right? As the concentration of the hydrogen proton goes up, right? The pH is going down. There's more and more of this. The equilibrium shifts this way because that's what it does in a buffer system. And so I'm making more carbonic acid in the oceans. But what is happening to my bicarbonate ion? Guess what? It's being sucked up to make this shift in the carbonic acid um, equilibrium. And so I have less bicarbonate for these organisms that need to use to, we, they need that to make their shells. And so what is happening is that shelled organisms like these pteropods, even in just a few days in a more acidic ocean, they're going to break down. And of course, okay, why do you care about pteropods? Because those shelled organisms form the basis of the food chain um, in the oceans. And so that's why you should care. So Guys, I hope that was helpful, and um, I will see you in class.